I'm going to be describing something very unbelievable. And in order to get there, I need to take you on a journey. Okay, I hope you're ready for this journey. Okay, so sit back. I know. The Shlem is ready. Take a deep breath. Relax your back. Breathing out slowly. Relax your cheekbones. Let everything be soft, heavy, arms, just relaxing, breathing in. I'm going to take you on a journey back to the days of Rabbi Akiva. Okay? And really, going to see that this is happening inside of us right now, and that this is happening inside the world, and this is going to give us tremendous insight into how to change our lives, and live great lives. Tan Rabon, I'm reading you a Gemara from Brachas, Samech Aleph Amit Beis, 61, Folio 2, very good Gemara to look up. We learn the following. There was a certain time when the ancient Roman government, the ancient Romans made a decree against learning Torah. And you'll come to realize that everything in the Gemara, the more you learn Torah, is not something that happened one time. It's not a... This is not a history book. The Torah is not behind some glass that you go to visit in a museum. The Torah is inside our hearts right now. It's alive, mamish, every second. So this decree is happening in all times, until Mashiach comes. So there was a decree against learning Torah. Now that sounds pretty bad, and it was. A decree against mitzvahs. A decree against... Practicing the Torah. So what happened? During that time, Ba Papus ben Yehuda, a very interesting person who was a Chacham, he was a very intelligent person. Some say that this was Papus ben Yehuda was the husband of Miriam Magdala, was the husband of a certain woman named Miriam, who we'll talk about later. Mary, and Papas ben Yehuda has quite a long story in other places in the Gemara, and for our purposes, this is a, a time in Papas' life that during this decree against Klal Yisrael, against the Jews that were not allowed to learn Torah and teach Torah, he found a Matzah Rabbi Akiva, and he saw during that time that Rabbi Akiva was teaching Torah. Shahaya makel kahilus berabim v'oisik b'Torah. He wasn't only teaching Torah, he was gathering mega amounts of people, mega amounts of followers to teach Torah at a time where it was illegal. It was punishable by death to learn Torah, to believe in God. Sounds like the early censorship you can only have the narrative that we, the ancient Roman government, tell you that you can have. Now, that's always a bad sign. Where they started to run the state radio, and now no longer can Klal Yisrael teach Torah. So here's Rabbi Akiva, our hero. Not only is he teaching Torah, you might have even thought he should be, you know, maybe teach privately. But Farhesia, in public, and gathering huge amounts of people to learn Torah. Amen. Ah. Shazandra berries. This is good stuff, my friends. You'll look it up after. You have to check for bugs. This is very good. So Rabbi Akiva is teaching Torah by Rabbim. Amar lei. So Papas ben Yehuda said, Akiva. And notice he doesn't even say Rabbi Akiva. Akiva. As if, like, they're somehow on the same level. 
Iyatanis Yarim and Nea Malchus? Are you not worried about the government, the Romans, for going against the decree? They said, you're not allowed to teach Torah. You have to only follow the ancient Roman narrative of what life is all about, which was, of course, idol worship. Aren't you afraid that you're going against their narrative? Akiva? He's speaking to the God of Lador. He's speaking to the greatest, maybe, rabbi of all time, the greatest sage in the history of the world. So Rabbi Akiva answered back, Amar Loi, Em Sholacham Let me tell you an analogy. You should know, uh, there are some additions that say before he told him this analogy, he said the following to him. He said, from the Yalkut Shmoini, it says, Amar Loi, Atta Papus Ben Yehuda, Aren't you Papus Ben Yehuda? Aren't you the one Sha'imra Malecha Shachacham Aren't you that very pupus that people seem to say that you're like, you know, learned or intelligent or highfalutin? Aren't you that, uh, that, that Ivy League graduate that they talked about? You're not wise, you're a fool. Let me now tell you an analogy of how foolish you are. So what do we have in the story so far? Decree against teaching Torah. Rabbi Akiva, not just teaching Torah, but teaching Torah, makilos, kihilos, barabim, mega, like megaphone in MetLife Stadium. Thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands. And, and Pappas gets it like, you know, like he gets on, bring me the, Akiva, like stop the sheer. Don't you know? Are you afraid? So you, they call you smart? You're a fool. Let me tell you an analogy as to how foolish you are. You may have heard this analogy, but let this analogy sink deep into your, into your soul. Let it penetrate the deepest, deepest place inside of you. Let me tell you an analogy as to what this all could be compared to. Let me tell you an analogy about a fox that was walking along the banks of a river. And the fox was sniffing around into the river David Shloime, and he's, he noticed that the fish were going from one place to the next in the river. They were kind of running away. They wouldn't stay in one spot for too long. Amr Lahem, so the fox told and asked the fish, tem Why are you guys running away from place to place? Amr so the fish told the fox, Mipnei, because of the nets that the fishermen are trying to cast their nets into the river, into the sea. And if we are staying still, the fishermen will know how to throw the net and just drag us out and eat us up. So we have to stay on the move. So we're moving around. So the fox said the following, I've got a great etza for you. I've got great advice, fish. Why don't you come up onto the dry land? We'll live together. Sounds great. Right? I'll protect you. And the fox even makes an interesting statement. The way that my forefathers and your forefathers also lived together. What does that mean? The Mepharshim say, when God was creating the world, before God separated between the water and dry land, 
seemingly all of the creatures were in the sea. Only afterwards did they separate. Why can't we just all go back to being together? One happy family. Sounds nice. The only problem is, is that at that time, there wasn't a separation between the fish and the wild animals yet. But now there is. So the fox is saying, let's just go back, you know, the good old days. It'd be great. It sounds so nice. Amrulai. So now the fish say back to the fox. Aren't you the one that they say is the smartest from all the animals? You're the pikeach, the cleverest of all the animals? You're not smart, you're a fool. You're the most foolish of the animals. And listen to the response. Bimkoim chiyuseinu anamisyarim if in the place where we're alive, where are fish alive? Water. In the water. If in the water there's already a sense of fear, in the water where we're alive, we're afraid. In the place that we die, i.e. out of the water, well, sh shouldn't we certainly be afraid of certain death? And you, the fox, that's going to eat us. Besides the fact that we're going on to dry land, and then there's you, the fox. In the place of our life, it's safer to go outside of our life. So said there be a kiva back to Papas ben Yehuda. Afanachnu achshav. So too, Rabbi Kiva said back, the Papa Ben Yehuda, he said now also that there's a decree of death. No learning Torah. Now we know that Torah is our life. Torah is mamish, the place that we live. Ki hem chayeinu Like the Nefesh speaks out, that if ever there was a moment that nobody was learning Torah in the world, the whole world would go back to nothingness. Torah is literally our life. And it's not even accurate to say that it's like oxygen. You know, we say Torah is like oxygen. You know, you can go for oxygen for a few minutes. But Torah, if there wasn't Torah for a second, for a nanosecond, the whole universe would go back to nothingness. It's ki hem chayenu. It is life. It's not oxygen which lets you stay alive. It's the fabric of life. It's life itself. So, Papas, you fool! If us, Klal Yisrael, if while we're learning Torah, there's fear, by us stopping to learn Torah, you think that's going to make it any better? Us stopping to learn Torah, moving away from life, going into a place of death, uh, shouldn't we be more afraid? So Rabbi Kiva, of course, continued to teach, continued to teach, didn't stop. And this has been our story for many, many years, is that no matter what, we teach and we learn Torah. If we stop learning Torah, Allah has come the kama. Certainly, There'll be nothing. There'll be only death. Gvaldek. Gvaldek. Now what happens? So the Gemara goes on. This is all one journey and one build-up to the ultimate love of God. Amrloi hayam mu'atim. Not so long went by. And what happened? The Rishoyim took Rabbi Akiva. They captured him. And should Fasuhu, Rabbi Akiva, they took Rabbi Akiva. And where did they put him? They put him into jail, the base Asurim, getting him ready for death. The Tafsul of Papas Ben Yehuda. They also took 
Pappas. Why did they take Pappas? He wasn't teaching Torah. <coughs> and they put them both in the same jail cell. I'm relying. So, Rabbi Kiva said, Pappas. Me have You know, what did you do here? Like, how, how did you get here? I'm relying. So look what he says back. Ay. Ashrecha Rabbi Akiva. Shinit pasta al divrei Torah. You, Rabbi Akiva, you are praiseworthy. You were taken into captivity. You were taken into jail. Forgiving of yourself to teach Torah and continue the traditions and to continue to bring life and God consciousness into the world. But oi loi la papas. Oi vei to me. I.e. papas. Shinitpas al dvarim betelem, that I was taken by doing nothing. What does it mean? The Romans found out about this back and forth between Rabbi Akiva and Papas. And when Rabbi Akiva was taken because he was defending and teaching Torah, why was Papas taken? Because he did nothing to defend and try to disprove Rabbi Akiva. It's not so easy to disprove Rabbi Akiva, you know. Rabbi Akiva's, you know, good luck. But the Romans heard, I guess they had some spy technology, some Alexa spy stuff, and they heard what was going on. And because of that, they knew that Papus, instead of trying to fight back and disprove Rabbi Akiva, he just acquiesced. He acquiesced to the story of the marshal and agreed that, in fact, that was an accurate description, and he was taken by the points of Rabbi Akiva. But really, the Romans would have wanted him to fight back. So he was taken not for defending the faith, but for literally doing nothing. And he started to feel, oh my goodness, what has become of my life? I was taken for doing nothing. At least I should have done something for God. And here comes the famous part. And it looks like we're going to have to really do this tomorrow. I know, I'm sorry, there's too many cliffhangers here. But we'll begin. Yesterday. This is all a build-up to answering. It's all a build-up to the ultimate third level of love. Let's see if we get to it. I'm going to leave it a little bit probably as a, as a, as a riddle of what the third is, but I'm giving you all the information to figure it out. Even the fact that I'm choosing this Gemara is extremely telling. Extremely telling. So now the Gemara is going on and describing the execution of Rabbi Akiva for what he did for teaching Torah in public, for continuing the tradition, for continuing the Messiah. B'Shah Shahit Siyos Rabbi Akiva Lahariga. At the time they were taking Rabbi Akiva out to be killed, Zman Kriya Shmahaya. It was the time of saying, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. And they were scraping his flesh off with burning hot Combs raking the flesh off of his body in order to kill him in a very, very uh, painful way, an exceptionally painful way. And at that moment, he was accepting upon himself the unity of God. We know that Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad is an absolute acceptance of the truth that there's nothing but God of Ein Oid Melvado there's only you Hashem Echad there's nothing but you Hashem and it's, excuse me, very interesting that right excuse me, right after Shema is the verse of loving God which means that the verse of loving God is coming out of Shema Yisrael is coming as a, as a natural result of Shema Yisrael. I'm giving you guys a lot of clues here in this riddle. 
and you're going to see everything come together. So as he is screaming out, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, his students are standing there. Amr Eloi Tamidov, Rabbeinu, Ad Khan, Rabbi, it's enough, it's too much. And you're going through such a, a torturous event, and you're uh, seemingly... In love. I, I, we don't understand. It's too much. Now, by the way, you have to pay very close attention to other times that Rabbi Akiva shows up in the Gemara and something happens and everybody is crying and Rabbi Akiva is laughing. Rabbi Akiva is in... He's not doing what everybody else is doing. I'll give you one example. And this is going to be for you guys to think about. There's a famous story in the end of Gemara Makkas, where right at the end, after the destruction of the second base Hamikdash, so the Tanaim are on a walk around Yushalayim. And they arrive at an outlook right here. Harzais Mesha Torah, literally right here. And they could see onto Harabais, they could see onto the Temple Mount. And it's all plowed into the ground. And interestingly enough, what do they see run out of the Holy of Holies? A fox. They see a fox running out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And all the rabbis are crying. That looks, look what has become of the place of our intimate, infinite intimacy with God. A place that now foxes are just running around. It's become profaned, destroyed, graffitied, tagged up. You know, crack users, fentanyl users. Hashem Yirachim. They're all crying. And Rabbi Akiva's laughing. And I said, Rabbi Akiva... How are you laughing? And he says, how are you crying? He says, we're crying because, it's, isn't it obvious? He said, but Rebbe, why are you laughing? He says, you know, because there's two prophecies. There's one prophecy that says that the mount of the Beis HaMikdash is going to be plowed over into the ground and overrun by foxes. And it's going to be destroyed. And the next prophecy says that after that it's going to be rebuilt for all eternity. And now I know, it wasn't clear when that first prophecy, what it was going on, which Beis HaMikdash, but now I know that that prophecy is going on this second Beis HaMikdash. I know. And now I know that this is it. As soon as this is rebuilt, it's going to be for eternity. So I'm laughing because I already see the third base of Mikdash. I already see it. I already see it. It's alive in my eyes. And they all said, Akiva Nichamtanu, Akiva Nichamtanu, Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. You've given us hope. I just want to end, and then we're going to pick up from this Gemara tomorrow of Akiva, Rabbi Akiva being tortured to death, is a famous story about Napoleon. When Napoleon was conquering the world, so there was one day where he walked in and there was a Jewish community and he walked in to a shul and he heard Jews crying on the floor with ashes and he asked one of his ministers, one of his generals, go find out what's happening here. And he, 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 the general came back and said, Napoleon, they're crying because their temple had been destroyed in Jerusalem. He said, a temple in Jerusalem? I would have known about that. A temple that was destroyed? I, 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 I heard, Go back in and ask what's going on. And the general went back and he said, the Jews said, yeah, you know, our, our temple was destroyed about uh, 1,700 years ago. 
And he came back and he told Napoleon. And Napoleon said these words. He said, any people who are still crying and still yearning for their temple, 1,700 years, now 2,000 years later, and it's not left our hearts for one second, it's only getting more powerful, certainly will merit to see it rebuilt. The third base of English is coming. And there's a big secret here that Rabbi Akiva is telling us. We're going to have to see really what's going on in this Gemara. Why, as he's dying, as his soul is leaving his body, that there's something very, very deep happening right now with Shema. And I want you guys to think now. This is your homework. Even though I don't like that word. It sounds too academic. This is your... Your mission, to be misboinen, to think about what's the connection of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and what's the connection to loving God. And Bezrat Hashem, with that, we'll see Mamish, the rebuilding of the third base of Mikdash, with Mashiach Tzidkin, from here, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day, my friends. All the best. And don't worry, we're going to get to it. It's coming. Shkoyach.